Our scripture reading this morning is Ezekiel 3, verses 22 through 27, and Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And the hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said to me, Arise, go out into the valley, and there I will speak with you. So I rose and went out into the valley, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, like the glory I had seen by the Kabar Canal, and I fell on my face. But the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and he spoke with me and said to me, Go, shut yourself within your house. And you, O son of man, behold, cords will be placed upon you, and you shall be bound with them, so that you cannot go out among the people. And I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth, so that you shall be mute and unable to reprove them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who will hear, let him hear. And he who will refuse to hear, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is God's word. In 597 before Christ, there was a young priest who was kidnapped from his country and taken to a foreign land. He was among the 10,000 highly trained, highly skilled people who was taken as hostages to another country. He had witnessed a foreign power destroy his nation, his country, his culture, his values. Everything around him changed. Everything that defined him, everything that was valuable and dear to him, everything that meant something was taken from him. He found himself in the desert of a foreign land among foreign people, speaking foreign languages, worshiping foreign gods, following foreign values and morales. He had no hope that this would ever change. It seemed that a new power, a new culture, a new morality would devour everything that was dear to him. His holy places, his worship, his religion, his values, his God was overtaken by another God and other values. His nation, his identity, his religion, his God was overtaken by a more powerful morality, a more powerful culture, a more powerful nation. His freedom was replaced with captivity. His future was exchanged with hopelessness. His worship was silenced and his God remained silent. This young, man, young priest's name was Ezekiel. He was 25 years old. 600 years separates him from the moment when a, young, when a group of young Jew received the greatest commission give, ever given on the land that was taken from Ezekiel, from the God who seemed to be silent and who seemed to be overtaken by other gods. He was 25 years old when he he was taken into captivity and five long years spent in complete silence. God was silent. God silently watched what happened to his people. But that's not unusual in the Bible. You know, there are times when God was silent. Think about the 400 years of silence when the Jews were in slavery in Egypt. Twelve generations, and God did not have one word. Or think about Moses, 80 long years of silence before God spoke to him. 
Or think about Jesus when he was silent and was sleeping while the disciples were striving for their lives in the boat, fighting the winds and the sea. But when everything seemed to be lost, when everything fell into decay, when hope was nothing but a meaningless word, when it seemed that it's too late, then God spoke. At the time and in the place where it was least expected, in the desert of Babylon, God spoke to Ezekiel. Now, if I were Ezekiel, I would want God to come with a message to punish my enemies. God, you need to destroy Babylon. Look what they did to us. Look at the injustice that happened to us. Why didn't you punish them? But God had nothing to say about Babylon. He did not have any message to them. He had a message to his people, to the church, to his people. 600 years later, the disciples received a a similar commission, and we'll compare those two commissions in a moment. And their land, land was also occupied by a foreign power. And their culture fell into decay and was occupied and oppressed by another foreign culture, an immoral culture. Yet when Jesus commands them, he had nothing to say about the culture. He gave a commission. He gave a commission to Ezekiel, a message to his people, and he gave a commission to his disciples. Now God, if you observe in the Bible, you see that God carefully chooses the places where he commissions his people, where he wants to meet with Ezekiel. You know, and I was thinking, why, why is that? I mean, places are important in the Bible. Now, and, and then I came to this conclusion, we, places are important for us. I mean, I don't know how many, probably a lot of you are old enough to remember, I am old enough to remember, to know exactly where I was when 9-11 happened. I mean, I, I remember where I was in my office and heard the news, and I remember, you know, turning on the TV and watching the, I mean, everything. Because important moments are defined by the place where we are as well. Uh, Places and moments define us. Significant moments are associated with significant places. I vividly remember the moment that happened exactly 29 years ago today. Maybe even the hour. Yes, close to the hour today. When my daughter was born, my first born child, and I was holding, holding her. And I remember... You know, the windows, I remember the people, I remember the door. I even can recall the smell of the hospital, what happened. Because that moment burned into my cells that marked me. And there are moments like that. And that's why God carefully chooses the places where, where he's meeting with us. He, he, he directs Abraham to go to the hill country. Because that's where he wants to meet with him. He tells Moses, I want to meet with you in the, in the mountain of Sinai. Elijah, I want to meet with you in the mountain of Horeb. Jesus says to the disciples, I want to meet with you in the mountain. Because that's where I'm going to give you a commission. Most of those meeting places are mountaintops where God wants to meet with his people. Now, I love mountains, okay, so, so I understand why God called his people to the mountain places. Where, you know, where we, we used to live in Hungary, in Budapest, it's a hilly, hilly country, it's a hilly place. I mean, we always saw uh, the mountains until God called us to the pancake of Kansas. <laughs> we, we all love the mountain top of experiences of our lives. That's why Peter at the mountain of transfiguration tries to make that moment permanent 
and, and say, we're going to build something here. It's so great to be on the mountaintop because we are protected. We see the future. We have perspective when we are on the mountaintop of our lives. But it's really interesting that God appoints a different meeting place for Ezekiel. He tells Ezekiel that, I want to meet with you in the valley. Now, valleys are dark places. You know, we talk, you know, Psalm 23, the valleys of the shadow of death. It's unprotected. You do not have a perspective from the valley like you do have in the mountaintops. You don't see the future because the problems and the pains and the hurts and the traumas are rising above you. And that in that dark place where God wants to meet with Ezekiel. You know, C.S. Lewis says that holy places are dark places. Now, I don't like the valleys of my life. Um, I'm sure you don't either. Your valleys of your life. You know, I, there are many valleys that I can re- recall that I absolutely hated. You know, I, I remember the, the valleys of my abusive childhood where I had to grow up, or the valleys of 200 days spent in the hospital for fighting for my life, or I vividly remember the valley of Easter of 1995 when the doctors told us that our firstborn child will, will suffer significant you know, health deficiencies and she will be handicapped. So they made a sign a paper that we are not willing to abort her. And it's our responsibility. And they yelled at us that she's going to be a burden on society. Six, four more months of very difficult dark valley. Now that firstborn child is a medical doctor now in the United Kingdom in Cambridge. God did a miracle, heard our cries, and he met with us in the valley. Or I remember June 29th, 1998, when our second child was born, and he almost died as well as my my wife. And for a year, we did not know if he's going to be healthy. One year of dark valley. I remember the, the valleys of ministry, 2004. I was asked to take over the leadership in Hungary uh, of our ministry, which the previous leadership accumulated a half a million dollar debt, and 70% of our staff left, and all the ministries were shut down. And I remember the struggle with the Lord that I don't want to do that. Or I remember the valleys when I was 50, eight years ago, when the Lord called us to come to the U.S. and serve here as missionaries. And I did not understand why God is asking something from me that I don't want to do. I mean, why, why here? I know the U.S. is right now the fifth largest nation with the most non-Christians residing within its geopolitical border. The U.S. has more non-Christians than the whole population of Russia. 168 million people in the United States claims that they don't believe in God. And that number is growing 4.5% every single year. 4,000 churches closes every year. 2.5 million people leave the church every single year in the United States. While we were having our Bible studies and having great things in the church, that's what happened in our environment. And I, I, I struggled with the Lord for two years because I did not want to bring my family here. I did not want to leave my daughter you know, far away in, in, a, in, in the UK, in Europe, while we live here. I did not want to put my youngest son through the public school of this country. I, I did not want to live, you know, continents away from them or seeing our elderly parents left alone uh, or losing name and fame and starting over starting over with the insurance, with the, with the retirement and everything. I did not understand why my children and parents had to pay the price of my obedience. Were you ever so deep 
in the valley of your life that you were angry with God? I was. I know King David was. I know Job was. I know Jesus cried out on the cross, why have you forsaken me? I do not understand. Why are you doing this to me, God? So how do you go from being angry with God because of the valleys of your life to living on mission for God? Well, that's exactly what happened to Ezekiel. God transformed Ezekiel's valleys of darkness to a glorious meeting place with him. So what happened to Ezekiel in the valley is the same thing that happened to the disciples on the mountaintop. First, the glory of the Lord awaited Ezekiel in the darkness of the valley. Now we read this, that the glory of the Lord stood there. What did Ezekiel do when he got to the valley? He fell on his face because he saw the glory of God and worshiped him. God wants to transform the valleys of your life into the place of worship. Ezekiel's missional living starts with worship. How did the disciples' mission of living start? You know, this, the same way. The Great Commission did not start with go and make disciples. I know everybody quotes this way, but that's not how it starts. We read in verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him. The Great Commission starts with worship. It's not, it doesn't start with going. It starts with worship. It started with Ezekiel. God wants to transform the mountaintops of your life into the place of worship. It doesn't matter where you are, in the valley of your life or in the mountaintop. God first and foremost wants to transform you into a worshiper. Because that's where mission starts. Mission always starts with worship. It always grows out of a worshipful heart which is thankful and grateful for everything God did for him or her. You know, your mission starts with your worship. Now, worship is not, mainly not what you say. It's how you live. You respond with your life to God, with your decisions. Worship is that at every single ear, in every single area of my life, Christ is the Lord, and I worship him, and I honor him with my decisions. Every single area, you know, my marriage, my finances, my workplace, my hobbies, what I watch, everything is a worship. So we respond to God's goodness with our whole life, not just with our words. So uh, your mission starts with your worship. Doesn't, doesn't matter how much I try to convince about the missional need, about the loss, and telling you about all the hundreds of millions who are going to hell without Jesus. If you do not have a worshipful heart, this is, you're not going to be involved in mission. So the first thing, what's so great about the Great Commission, that it starts with worship. It's about worship. Second, Ezekiel receives power. We, we, uh, we read this. The Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. Ezekiel receives God's power in the valley. He receives power for the mission he will be charged with. Jesus also promised his power for, for the mission that we are charged with. In Acts 1.8, he says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit co comes upon, uh, has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So power is given. So the second great thing about the Great Commission is that we are empowered to do it. It's worship 
It starts with worship and God's power. B before even we go, before we open our mouth, we already worship him and we are already received his power. What a great thing that is. The third, the Lord spoke to Ezekiel. Just as Jesus also spoke to the, his disciples. Matter of fact, it's really interesting what, what as you read uh, the passage longer, it's really interesting the conversation with God has with Ezekiel because he says that Ezekiel, okay, I'm going to be so close to you that when you do not hear a word from me, you just shut your little pie hole, okay? Just close your mouth. When I speak, you speak. When I move, you move. What I say, you say. That closeness and that being taught by the Lord. And Jesus uh, confirms that in the Great Commission because he said that, hey, I mean, I already taught you. I told you everything. I instructed you. I educated you. So all you need to do is you need to teach what you had been taught. So it's simple. So the Great Commission is the evidence that we had been taught by Jesus. That Jesus already educated us, informed us. The king of the universe who knows everything already confirms and affirms that you know what you need to do to fulfill uh, the Great Commission and to obey, to obey uh, the Great Commission. So the third great thing about the Great Commission is that the God of the universe already spoke to us. He gave an evidence and told us, I already spoke to you. So you don't need more information to be able to fulfill the Great Commission. Fourth, Ezekiel receives God's call in the valley. He receives a mission, a calling, a purpose in life. Now, when everything was aimless and purposeless because everything that defined him was taken from him, he was there in a completely uh, different world and culture where there was no hope that his past will be restored or anything from that will remain. Suddenly, God gives him a reason to get up every morning. You have a mission. You have a purpose to live for. And that's very significant. You know, significant. Uh, this summer, um, I met with, I think, 12, 11 or 12 of my former 8th grade classmates. We haven't seen each other for 44 years. And... Um, uh, one, of, one of the guy that I was friend with told me that, you know, I remember that in eighth grade you talked to me about God. And, uh, and he said that, you know, 44 years went by. Can you tell me what the purpose of life is? And I thought, how tragic that is that you are 58 years old and you do not know the purpose of your existence. That's just so sad. So I concluded the evening with reading them, John 3, all 11 of them, and explaining the love of God and how they can live for the purpose that God created us for. That's how important it is to have a purpose, and our purpose is what God gave us. We are on a mission. The church is on a mission to point to the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is at hand. So we need to point people to that. And lastly, God promised his presence. When I speak, I will open your mouth. I will be close to you. I will be your mouth. I already mentioned that. But Jesus also promised his presence with the Great Commission. He says, I will, uh, I will be with you always until the end of the earth. So his presence is promised in the Great Commission. So the Great Commission is not great because, well, we're going to do great things. Or 
because we're going to lead millions to people or because the scope is so vast that this is the greatest strategic plan on earth. The Great Commission is great because God transforms the valleys of your life and the mountaintops of your life into the place of worship. So you could start worshiping him. He meets with us in our brokenness and he reveals his glory. He turns broken vessels into grateful worshipers. You know, one question I ask when we hire any missionary, the, the most important question that I ask is this. Tell me a brokenness story of your life. Tell me how you were broken. I do not hire unbroken people because they are cocky, they are power hungry, they, they want to keep everything under control. But broken people who went through the valley of life, who saw the glory of God in the lowest point of their life, they will keep things with open hands. And they will just say, all my life is nothing more than just a worship for the Lord. So the Great Commission is great because we bow down as we see Jesus and worship him. The Great Commission is great because we receive God's supernatural power to do the impossible with the nothing we have. You know, when, when Jesus says, well, feed the, uh, Philip, uh, feed the 5,000. What? We don't have anything. I mean, we don't have money and, uh, and no Walmart. So we cannot do that. But that's exactly what he wants. Bring the nothing you have to Jesus so he could do the impossible through that nothing you have. So that's, that's the, the second great thing. The third is that the Great Commission is great because it's the evidence that we had been taught by Jesus. He already taught us what we need to know. The fourth, the Great Commission is great because it gives meaning and a purpose and a goal to live for. And finally, the Great Commission is great because his presence is, pro is promised with it. I am with you. The Great Commission is great because it's a relationship with our Savior. It's worship. It's being taught by Jesus. It's, it's receiving his power. It's his presence. But there's a problem with the Great Commission. And it, the problem is that it comes with the cross. It comes with a price. Ezekiel's life is a proof of that and the disciples' life is a proof of that. Today there are many Christians who love his heavenly kingdom, but few who are willing to carry his cross. First century Christians were obedient to the point of death 21st century Western Christians are obedient to the point of inconvenience. Now, your leadership is committed to help you to live, to help you to live uh, in obedience to the, to the Great Commission. You're going to find a little bookmark where you can find information, simple steps that you can take to start living missionally where you live, work, play where you live your life and start conversations. It's called the prayer, care, share lifestyle. I encourage you to study that and, and scan that QR code to learn more information about that. So let me finish with this. We read two stories. In both stories, we read about God meeting with his people, showing his glory, giving his power, sharing his divine knowledge, sending his messengers, and promising his presence. Why is that so important? Why is this so important to God? What, 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 is, what is on his heart that he wants to send people, give his power, show his glory, promise his presence? What's on his heart that he's willing to choose average nobodies like you and I. 
and willing to share his presence, his glory, and power with us. His heart is beating for something. What do you hear? What do you hear when you listen to the heartbeat of Jesus? Let me tell you what I hear. I hear four things. It's like the four chambers of the human heart. There are four heartbeats of Jesus. First, his heartbeat says this, I came to seek and save the lost. My heart beats for the lost. Second, go and make disciples. He says that my heart beats for every follower being equipped, transformed, and multiply. Third, I hear Jesus saying, I have, as he, as he sees the masses, he said, I have compassion on them. You give them something to eat. My heart moves to the broken Mass, the broken masses enter the needy. And finally, I hear him saying, shepherd my sheep. My heart burns for the church to be built up. So Jesus' heartbeat leaves us with hard questions. Let me conclude with these four questions. First, how will the millions destined for God's wrath be reached and rescued. How, how will that happen? How will new followers of Jesus be equipped, transformed, and multiply the kingdom? Because that's his heartbeat. He wants to do that. We need to come alongside and help lift that burden. Third, how will the world come to understand Jesus' heart of love? What are we helping to redeem? You know, I told uh, a, a story in, in uh, this summer. We were in D.C. Uh, and, and at a meeting and then visiting the capital. And as we came out, we, we found ourselves in the middle of the largest LGBTQ pride parade you could imagine. And we couldn't find our way out. We couldn't get an Uber. It was tens of thousands of people. And I thought, how does Jesus see them? Because what we have, it's a repulsive reaction. And we say, it's disgusting. And, and, and you know, when I, when I asked Jesus, Jesus, why don't you remove the evil from this world? You know what his response is it? How about I start with you? How about I start with you? You are the evil that, needs to, that needed to be removed, but I died for you instead. So how about you going and, and showing the love that I have for these lost sheep and lost people? And the final question, how can I be engaged in shepherding the good news of the kingdom throughout the whole world until there are people from every tribe, nation, and tongue who are obedient to the faith? We need to put our feet where his heart is. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, you are so good to us. You meet us in our valleys or in our mountaintops. We want to bow down and worship you. And out of this worshipful heart, we just want to obey and do what we can, Lord, to serve the mission and spread the love that you have for this lost, lost humanity. Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on me. So I would see people how you see them. I would be willing to take the steps that, I, that you would want me to take to spread your love, to share and proclaim the eternal salvation that you offer to every single person. In your name we pray. Amen.